And automation and artificial intelligence have always been hot topics. On the one hand, they bring about tremendous corporate efficiencies and cost-cutting benefits, streamlining operations. On the other hand, it destroys jobs and can, de can deplete the workforce. The latest research suggests the next phases of workplace automation will displace only a quarter of the American workforce in the next decade. What will this look like? Here to break it all down is Richard Wolf, professor of economics emeritus at the University of Amherst, Massachusetts, and the author of Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism, Richard Wolf. Now, Professor, uh, let's just start in. If a quarter of the U.S. workforce, and that would be 36 million Americans, are highly exposed to automation and risk of being replaced within the next decade, what can we do now to mitigate the impact on employment and on wages? Well, there's two things. First, we have to question automation. We should have been doing this for the last 100 years. We haven't done it. When you replace people with machines, in other words, you make people more productive because the new machine allows one man or one woman to do what it used to take two, you always have two ways to go. In the business world, the goal is profit. So you lay off half, for example, with a machine that's twice as productive. You lay off half your workers because you don't need them. The half that remains can do as much as all of them did before. You make the same goods, you sell them in the market, and you, the employer, keep as profits half of the payroll that you used to have to pay out to the workers you've now laid off. That makes sense to the employer. But to the workers, of course, this is a disaster. It means half the people lose their jobs. It means local communities are decimated because the laid off people cannot spend money in the local store. It means local communities are not getting the taxes from people who don't have jobs. You can see the proliferation as you go around America because we've been living this for a long time. There is always an alternative. You could have said to the same number of people, Here's how we're going to use the new machines. Everybody works half time. You don't work eight hours a day, you work four. That way, with four hours and a doubling of the productivity of the machine, you produce the same goods, you have the same sales, and nobody loses their job. In other words, the technology enables us to increase leisure. And here's the irony. We have always said that one of the things we like is to be more productive so we have free time. It's always been the irony of capitalism that it doesn't deliver the free time it could have because it substitutes more profits for the few than extra leisure for the many. If we really want a plan for artificial intelligence impact, we ought to revisit that basic question and make a commitment as a society that we're going to use the new technology for the leisure, more leisure for the many, rather than more profit for the few. Now, how big of a problem is this really? Because isn't this a repeat of history? In the 18th and the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution didn't lead to any major social upheavals or widespread suffering. When technology destroys jobs, people find other jobs. So how big of, the, of a problem is this really? Well, I think I would correct you just a little bit. Yes, we eventually found other jobs. But the key word there is eventually. Large numbers of people lose their jobs. That may mean that they're without work for a year or for two or for three. We know in America that there's no savings for the mass of a working class to rely on. Those people are going to interrupt their lives. They're going to lose their connections, lose their work habits. The cost to them will be staggering. And even if eventually we get more jobs indirectly as the next phase, it will often be different people and you will have severe social problems in the conflict between those who have been hurt by this technological change and those who get the jobs, the new jobs that may emerge. So even if, and it's a big if, everybody gets eventually a job, that eventually can be socially explosive. 
Yeah, Professor Wolf, uh, in your first answer, you really uh, did a great job of putting the real issues on the table, the questions here uh, uh, in terms of the actual application of technology. It can be used to increase right. profits or in a more uh, worker-directed or perhaps a scenario where workers have more influence over the uh, production process, uh, that, that those gains could be plowed back into free time for workers. And so it's really, right. you really put the finger on the, it's, uh, the, the application of the technology rather than the, um, the, the technology itself. But in terms of the actual, oh, go ahead. No, I think that, I, I would just like to expand on the good point that you made. It was never the technology that was the problem. The technology could be liberating. But in order for that to happen, we have to liberate people from the drudgery of eight hours a day, take advantage of the new technology by helping the mass of people. God knows what wonderful new things our society could enjoy if people had more time for their families, for their hobbies, to go back to school. Uh, we're talking about a society that could give more richness to the mass of people even if it wasn't so successful making profits for a handful of big corporations that are doing this. I think that's the key political, ideological, and fundamentally ethical question. Right, and then, but just looking at the technology then, uh, which, as it exists, which sectors now uh, are perhaps where workers are most threatened, or uh, conversely, could we see the biggest productivity gains if the, uh, and gains for workers if the technology were applied? From what I understand about artificial intelligence, what you're going to see is a massive displacement of what are basically service workers. You might think of the last 40 years as the technology wiping out manufacturing. If you put together technology and the movement of jobs out of the United States, those two things really wrecked the manufacturing sector and there is no sign that it's coming back. Artificial intelligence is going to do that for the service sector, which has so far escaped. And frankly, I am one of many economists who are very doubtful that the eventually is actually going to show up because we can't go back to the manufacturing that's not there anymore and if we really get rid of large numbers of service workers where else can they go right. and then the question of whether you do leisure or more profit becomes whether you take care of the mass of people by leisure or you have an enormous overhang of unemployed people who are going to be very unhappy and very angry. Mm. We're on the edge of a brave new world. We're glad we have Richard Wolf, Professor of Economics, Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst to guide us through. Thanks so much for your insight. Glad to be here. Thank you. I'm an advocate for worker cooperatives. I believe that the UK Labour Party's manifesto has democratized the economy, has some really good ideas in it about how to allow the workers to be owners, you know, the right of first uh, uh, refusal, you know, to actually buy a company out together as workers. Yeah. What do you think about that as a long-term solution going forward for our country? I think worker cooperatives are phenomenal. Um, and the more of that sort of structure we have, the better off we'd be. That's one thing I, I love about the Freedom Dividend is that workers having that sort of ownership stake becomes much more realistic in an economy where people all are sharing in the wards and have some resources to bring to the table. Where the worker subsistence model is just going to get more and more punishing. And so we have to make owners out of everyone of this society. That's one reason why it's called the Freedom Dividend, because that's what owners receive when they own shares of a company. They receive a dividend, and we are the owners and shareholders of this country. We should get a dividend, and that would put more workers in position to become owners of various businesses. And the more we develop those kinds of businesses, like solar and wind and hydropower, I mean, it becomes obvious this is the commons that we all actually, we're building this wealth, this wealth that you were talking about. We all built together. You know, even if some people are out of work for a while, everybody contributed to this for decades or however long, you know what I mean? So we should be able to get something back, and the wealth should not, this great wealth that's been created should not be going all the, primarily to the top. It's something like 80% now. It's ridiculous. 
So we have to start taking those measures to go in that direction and make sure that, that I think the system needs to reorganize the structure so that wealth is distributed differently in the first place. Yes. Don't you agree? And, and the most effective way to do that is through something like universal basic income to build what I call the trickle-up economy yes. from people and families and communities up. Uh, and there are, frankly, relatively few paths to try and build that economy. Uh, and in my opinion, everyone's going to understand very quickly that the fastest, most direct and successful path there is going to involve just putting money into people's hands. It's like a lot of other politicians are trying to backtrack into it in various ways. It's like, oh, we're going to try and make this free. We're trying to make that free. But uh, like the best way to make us all owners and beneficiaries is to put money in our hands. Exactly. And we'll contribute to the economy. And the money's just going to get circulated over and over again through the economy. Um, and we're all going to win. The, for it. Like, even if you go to a room full of CEOs, which I have spoken to, and uh, they know that their businesses do better in an economy where people have money to spend. And we'll be able to help people that actually are in need, like, you know, the people in depression, people that are on um, yeah. addicted to opioids and opiates, I'm sorry, opiates. And, and, and also, too, I'm an advocate for encouraging to people to be productive. And to be honest with you, I think most people actually want to be productive, of don't course. you? Yeah, uh, of course. And that's one of the things that studies have shown with uh, universal basic income is that work levels stay essentially the same. The only two groups that work less are new moms who spend more time with their kids and teenagers who graduate from high school at higher levels. So I don't think anyone's going to get mad at that. So I, I agree. If we have better measurements for our economy, uh, we can start solving the real problems of this age instead of uh, instead of this phantom GDP number, stock market uh, price growth that only advantages really the top fifth of the the population, and this phantom. Uh, headline unemployment number, which is completely um, not indicative of where we are as a society right now. Yeah, definitely, there's because there's underemployed, there's low wage jobs with little or no benefits, there's temporary gigs and temporary jobs, and it's and, and all of that. And there's labor force participation, which right now uh, is at 63 percent, which is uh, near a multi decade low in the same levels as Ecuador and Costa Rica. So, you know, there, there are all these pain points that we all see and feel in the economy and then we're cheerleading these phantom numbers that paint a rosier picture that we all know uh, rings false.